So uh, now without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome John A. Lawrence in celebration of his book, Arc of Power, inside Nancy Pelosi's speakership from 2005 to 2010. John, a visiting professor at the University of California Washington Center, wrote Arc of Power to provide a valuable account of the strategies, mechanisms, and challenges of congressional leaders as they gain, exercise, and lose power. John spent 38 years as a senior congressional staff member, eight of those years as the chief of staff for Nancy Pelosi. This book examines the role of personalities, factions, parties, and political institutions in the formation of national policy on key issues. Lawrence artfully demonstrates the challenges presented by intra-party fractional disagreements when writing complex legislation and illustrates that institutional tensions between the House and the Senate and Congress in the White House when the government is unified under one party or divided. He'll be in conversation with Norm Ornstein, a senior fellow emeritus at the American Enterprise Institute, where he's been studying politics, elections, and the U.S. Congress for more than five decades. He has also been in the store for events surrounding three of his own wonderful books. So please join me in welcoming John and Norm. Is this on? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so I am really honored and delighted to be here with John, who is an old friend. Uh, and I will tell you that this is a just a remarkable book. It takes us through some of the most important history uh, of the previous decade uh, from the uh, disastrous uh, economic collapse in 2008 and into 2009 through the uh, remarkable health care reform and many other things from an insider's perspective, but not just any insider. Uh, so we'll talk about John and the arc of his career as well as the arc of power, but I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative for a two-minute rant because obviously <coughs> this is a different uh, climate and dynamic today than it would have been if we had done this a week ago. Uh, the attacks on Nancy Pelosi, the threats on her life, have come about in part because it is, to me, an undeniable fact that Nancy Pelosi is the most consequential speaker in our lifetimes, at least. Uh, you could make a case uh, uh, for uh, Sam Rayburn, uh, but uh, I would also make a strong case for Nancy Pelosi. And it's because of that strength that she has been a target. Uh, and obviously what happened yesterday is beyond reprehensible. What is even more reprehensible is the response of the leaders of the Republican Party. Not one other than Mitch McConnell has said anything to condemn larger violence and the threats of violence. Not one word from Kevin McCarthy. And then presumed leaders like Glenn Youngkin making fun of it, uh, the loathsome Ronna Romney McDaniel, my, uh, hours after this attack occurred, leading the chance of fire Nancy Pelosi. And that tells us, I say this in part, because not just because I want to rant about it, but also because it fits in with some of what we're going to discuss and some of the arc of the book, the arc of power, which is the changes that have taken place in our politics over the past two decades. But it's also about how Nancy Pelosi has managed in the face of enormous headwinds to create some of the most consequential and important policies that we have seen uh, in our lifetimes. So John, let me start with this. You are a trained historian. You are now teaching history. Uh, but you spent a large share of your career uh, in the belly of the beast, working in Congress, starting with George Miller, then moving to Nancy Pelosi. How did you get into that? And talk about a little bit about your own career and how being a historian made a difference for you in what you did inside Congress. Well, thank you, uh, Norman. Thanks to everybody for coming. Nicole, thank wherever you are now. Thank you for your introduction. Um, 
it's really an honor for me to have to have Norm here. Um, uh, probably one of the, certainly one of the top congressional scholars of, of our era and, uh, and a good friend. Um, and I just came back, incidentally, from California uh, on the red eye. <laughs> so if I fall asleep, no, but, I, <laughs> but um, I, I was there at the time of this uh, terrible attack on Paul Pelosi and uh, walking literally into a KQED uh, interview uh, on, on the book. So um, I know Paul and, and the speaker have everybody's uh, best wishes and, uh, and uh, I hope he and, and our political system recover. I, I, uh, I got into this racket, um, that being uh, the government of the United States, um, <laughs> uh, right out of graduate school. I was, I was getting a PhD at Berkeley, um, and I wanted to frankly have a, a larger impact than I thought I was going to have um, teaching history, uh, assuming I could have gotten a job teaching history, which even in those days wasn't so easy. Um, and I happened to volunteer for George Miller when he was running. Uh, he was part of that uh, class of 74, which coincidentally is the title of my first book uh, of congressional history. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I came back here with him. Uh, that was a very consequential group of people that, uh, that uh, challenged many of the norms of, of congressional organization, congressional behavior at that time. Um, and uh, I worked for him in various capacities uh, until the, uh, the staff director of, of the Resources Committee, staff director of the Education Committee. Uh, I see some of my successors in both of those committees are here today. Um, sorry for what I left behind for you to clean up. And, uh, and then um, when the Democrats had, had made several efforts to, uh, in the late 90s, the early 2000s, to regain the control of the Congress and had failed. And Nancy Pelosi had made a decision very early on in the book. She says, I think I can do this better than these guys. Um, and it turned out she could. Um, for a variety of reasons, she brought a different perspective, certainly a different organizational sense. And she asked me to come over and be her chief of staff in 2005 when we were going to make that last, probably, effort uh, that, that we were pretty confident could succeed uh, in the third election of the Bush presidency. And when we did, I I, I, I was there as the minority it, when she was minority leader and stayed for the next four years as speaker and then another couple. Uh, and, and it's really that period of time, that's, that is that arc of history that we're talking about in this book. Not because I was there, but because what I wanted to look at specifically was what was involved with the acquisition, the exercise, and ultimately the loss of power. Um, and how the personalities and the individuals, and particularly the institutions, play their roles in the formulation of public policy with a particular emphasis on the House, and I'm happy to get more into that. As to the historian, uh, look, no historian can, can ask for more than to be an eyewitness. I was a little more than an eyewitness. I mean, uh, like many congressional staff people, you're there, you're you're in the, involved in, in cutting deals with your fellow staff people, occasionally with other with members, um, you know, people who are arguing with you, people who are being incredible pains in the neck, people who uh, are, are jeopardizing important legislation, and the Republicans also. Uh, you, had to, <laughs> you had to deal with them. You had to deal with them too. Uh, and um, I also saw it as a very transitional period where we moved from some possibilities of bipartisanship into what was have contemporarily, which is a largely um, one one party's checked out from the from the, the notion of, of serious legislation. So I made a decision when I started with Mrs. Pelosi that I was going to take notes, not notes that I thought were going to end up in a book, but notes that I thought would be valuable because I could provide an historian's perspective of what was going on inside meetings, uh, in uh, telephone conversations, in uh, strategy sessions with. Uh, her, with, with our leadership, our chairs, the Senate, uh, but also the White House and, and uh, other staff people. And I ended up with about 9,000 pages of those notes, um, which I started transcribing, um, and some fairly serious themes that I think don't get reflected in some of the popular journalistic uh, accounts uh, began to emerge. And I, f I felt that, that warranted uh, what became the arc of power. Uh, and it's a remarkably candid book, too, candid about the people uh, and uh, the tensions. So 
just talk for a minute, John. You came in with that class of 74 that transformed Congress. It was a liberal group, but a policy-oriented group. George Miller, um, a uh, classic progressive, but then worked with uh, George W. Bush on education reform in 2001. Talk a little bit about the arc of the two parties in Congress from the time you arrived, and let's talk about it until uh, you uh, moved in as the chief of staff to Pelosi. Then we'll turn to that. Well, I don't, I, I'm, I've given a bunch of these talks, and I don't want to turn this into one of my, my classes, although I have at least one student here who probably fall asleep if I tried. Uh, but I do think what's really important with that is, is to note that uh, the subtitle of that class of 74 had to do with the roots of partisanship. Um, and of course, by the time we get to the early 2000s, we see partisanship in a, in a very dramatic uh, fashion, measured in all sorts of ways that both historians and political scientists talk about in terms of ideological realignment. Um, the parties moving more roughly into parity as a result of the enfranchisement of black voters in the South moving into the Democratic Party and the conservative whites in the South moving into a revitalized Republican Party. And with that parity, we see a much greater likelihood of Congress uh, both being separated by narrow margins, even if they don't seem that mar narrow they are because of so many frontline members who constitute the the majority and are fearful of very often voting on difficult legislation, although they do, um, but also uh, a far greater chance of Congress flipping from one party to the other. From, from 1932 to 1994, a period of 62 years, Democrats controlled Congress for 58 years. And so for a lot of this period, it was not today's Democratic Party, but it was the Democratic Party. And, and therefore, the, the parties played certain roles and it was easier, in a sense, to do bipartisan legislation because the minority knew it had to make certain concessions to the reality of being in the minority. That begins to change, and I think, uh, as as the as the this this uh, this uh, movement into two roughly equal parties in the congressional level uh, emerges, and so that one of the and I alluded to this in the in the original question. What you really see in this period of time that, that the arc of power co co covers, I think, is the, the end of a genuine effort at that bipartisanship. And, and, and when I say bipartisanship, I, I would just point your attention. People say, you know, Congress can't work, government doesn't work, democracy doesn't work. I take you back to September 18th, 2008, uh, where Mrs. Pelosi is on the phone with the chairman of the Federal Reserve and she, he says, I think you better call a meeting of the, uh, of the congressional leadership. And she said, well, you know, it's a Thursday night. Maybe we can do it on Monday. And he says, no, there's not going to be an economy on Monday. Uh, you better call it for tonight. And they're five weeks from an election, a presidential as well as congressional election. Um, enormous consequences because now you have these parties realigned. Who wins actually means a very, very great deal. Congress works on a collaborative, bipartisan basis to produce the TARP legislation, probably, you know, the most unpopular legislation you could have come up with, right, giving $800 billion to the most hated people on the planet, um, with a lot of restrictions and payback requirements. But it's done on a bipartisan basis. And what's interesting about that is that once that election occurs in 2008, and now you have unified government, you have the Obama administration and large majorities, the Republican Party simply checks out of legislating and becomes increasingly, and I think ex with an acceleration in the 2010 election, the emergence of the Tea Party, a party that's more interested in denigrating government and obstructing than it is in actually legislating. And I, I know that sounds terribly partisan, and, and I, I suppose if you look at my career, you could make a case that I'm a partisan, but I think it, it's actually true, and, and it's played out in a very dramatic way. When the Republicans ultimately do win back control in 2010, if you look at the legislative history that they write for the ensuing two or three years, they can't pass any legislation without significant Democratic support because they've elected this group of Tea Party people in response to TARP, in response to Obama, in response to these big Democratic majorities who have no interest in legislating whatsoever. And I think that's where we've ended up. We had a presidential election two years ago where the Republican Party didn't even have a platform 
uh, and, and, you know, doesn't have a position on health care or climate change or gay rights or voting rights or any of those, of those, uh, of those issues. And I think it's going to be a, it's going to be consequential for them if they do win control how they're going to govern. So uh, it's interesting that you raise the TARP legislation because uh, I want to dig into that a little bit more. And you do uh, in great detail in the book. Uh, one part of it is that, of course, we know it failed the first time and only came back after, even after the Republican Treasury Secretary, the Republican appointed uh, uh, or nominated Fed chair said, the entire world economy is going to collapse. It was the Dow dropping more than in a single day than it ever had. It seems quaint now, 700 and some points, um, that jolted them. But one of the things that struck me in your book is George W. Bush calling Re Republican House members before the Tea Party group had come in and being given a complete cold shoulder. They didn't want to listen to him at all. And a pretty unflattering portrait, although we knew some of this, of John McCain, who pretty much checked out, even though he was the Republican nominee. So talk a little bit about how the seeds for the problems that Republicans were having were clearly there, and uh, what, and the, the reality that Nancy Pelosi worked more closely with George W. Bush on this than the Republican leader John Boehner uh, did. There's no question that, that uh, I think, I, I very often say, I think in some ways, although she would certainly point to health care, in some ways TARP may be the legislative achievement that, that has, is most consequential because it did indicate this willingness to take this enormous risk at the election, uh, with the upcoming election, working collaboratively with President Bush. As you mentioned, you, may, you folks may remember that um, as this, this crisis unfolded in incredibly rapid time, it was put together this bill with no hearings, uh, with uh, no committee action. It was completely written at the leadership level, House and Senate, uh, that uh, suddenly John McCain decided that uh, he wanted to stop the presidential campaign and have a White House meeting. Uh, to to have this this uh, worked out in a in a collaborative way, uh, Obama thought that was a terrible idea. Uh, I think that Bush thought it was kind of a stupid idea, but uh, you know his nominee was saying well, that's what we're going to do, and and so we all met down at the White House at the uh, at in the uh, uh, cabinet room, and uh, everybody went around the table talking about what they were prepared to do, and McConnell talked and Boehner talked. The only person who didn't say a word was John McCain, on whose behalf we had stopped the campaign, and we were waiting. And finally, Obama, and this story naturally is related in all its glory in, in the book, um, Obama, who we had designated, he was going, he not, not the speaker, not the majority leader, Harry Reid, were going to speak for the Democrats as long as he didn't propose any solutions. And, uh, and um, uh, he finally said, you know, we haven't heard from John, and it, it, this is his meeting. And McCain just went on this ramble down the highway, not knowing what he was talking And at that point, uh, Bush leans over to Pelosi, who with him, they, they had a reasonably good relationship, although they had fought horribly, over, particularly over Iraq. Um, and the economy, and said, I told you you would miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> and she leans over to him and says, no, I won't. <laughs> uh, and it, it was after that that, um, you know, we had to craft that bill with the agreement was that Boehner would produce 100 votes and we would produce the remainder. Boehner came to us, actually his chief of staff, Paul Nowakowski, he was a good friend, and said, this isn't working here. Our people will not vote for it. You need to do a Democratic-only bill. And I said to her, there isn't going to be a Democratic-only bill. I can pretty well guarantee that. And so that was the point at which it, it went to the floor. We had no choice. We were under the, under the gun. It failed. And there's a piece of this that's really institutionally important, because when it went over to the Senate, those of us who, and there's a fair number of you here who work in the House know the most dangerous thing you can do is let the Senate take the lead on a piece of legislation. Because what happened is that the Senate then added tens of billions of dollars to the bill 
in unrelated energy extenders that the House did not want in that bill because we wanted to refashion those their own way. And the bill then came back from the Senate, much more expensive. Um, and the people in the House who had not wanted to vote for it because it was so expensive had no choice at that point. It was either reject the bill and watch the economy crumble or accept the bill that was even worse than the one you sent over. The lesson there is that Pelosi had very strong words for the people in her own caucus, as well as John Boehner, and she did not mince words in private, and again, these conversations are related in the book, about this is why you have to step up to the plate in the House. You cannot give the Senate free reign, and the reason this bill comes back in the shape that it does is because of the fact you didn't exercise, you didn't produce the, bill, the votes that you said you were gonna produce. There's a bigger issue here, though, and I don't know if you want to get into it now or, or, or we can get into a question, and that is this disproportional role between the House and the Senate and how often, and this becomes, I, I don't think even though I lived through it that I was, I was really cognizant of it the way I did once I, I looked through the, the research, how often the House is put in the situation of what Steny Hoyer calls my way or the highway. Uh, the Senate comes back and, and said, oh, poor, pitiful us. You know, we have the 60-vote rule, or in some cases, even the 50-vote rule in, under the reconciliation process, and we just can't pass this bill the way you want it. But here's the way we can pass it, but you can't change it, because if you do, the version you send back is going to fail. And so that over and over puts the House in this, this in extremely contentious role. And to me, one of the amazing things about Nancy Pelosi uh, is not that she produces that liberal version of the bill that comes out of the House reflecting all the districts and factions and caucuses and sub-caucuses and sub-sub-caucuses that constitute the Democratic majority. That's not what's amazing. What's amazing is that she has the credibility with those people when the bill comes back to say, folks, we fought the good fight, but this is the version we've got to do because we've got a bigger mission here, which is to pass a law. So uh, that actually brings us to some of the more interesting dynamics that you recount in the book. Um, I'm a fan of Harry Reid, and I think uh, given what he had to deal with, he did an extraordinary job. But it's very clear that along the way, Nancy was not a big fan of Harry Reid because he kept coming back and saying, we can't uh, do this. So. Talk a little bit more about that relationship or the relationship that Pelosi had with other senators, uh, including Kent Conrad and uh, others who kept pushing back against what the House and what she wanted to do. Well, you know, you had, you had very briefly a 60-vote margin in the House. Uh, the and, 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 I'm sorry, in the Senate. And then and Kennedy dies, Paul Kirk gets appointed, and then you lose that in January in the special election. So the margin for doing anything through the filibuster was very, very, very tight. Again, you had no expectation that you were really going to get Republican help. They were always one, we're going to get Susan Collins, we're going to get Olympia Snow, you know, never there when you need them. And, uh, and, uh, and so each of these members, whether it was, whether it was Kent Conrad or, or other Democratic uh, members, Con Conrad being the, the budget chair, and so he was very concerned about deficit issues and he was pushing for an entitlement commission. And, you know, we were constantly being put in the situation of saying, in order to get what the president says he wants and what the overwhelming majority of the American people want, let alone Democratic party, we've got to put up with the corn husker uh, exception kick yeah, kick, yes. uh, in, in the, in the health care bill, special benefits for Nebraska and only Nebraska, uh, or other specialized provisions because the Senate enjoys this kind of leverage. Reed, who I also, I, I just have a very warm spot for him, and I think he's vastly underestimated in terms of how effective uh, he is. He, you know, he's a Senate majority leader, which I think Mitch McConnell once said that, well, somebody said, you know, the Senate Majority Leader is sort of like being the caretaker of a graveyard. You're, you're over a lot of people, uh, but they're not very responsive. Uh, and, 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 and uh, you, you know, Reed would always come in and just sort of throw his hands up and say, what can I do? And, and she would say, you can push the, you can push like I have to push. You know, I think a lot of times people assume the House is easy because you've got rules that are majoritarian. You've got a speaker who has real power, uh, and of course they're not. Most of these big bills we talk that 
Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama rammed through. We rammed through with two or three vote margin, even though we had a 45 seat margin uh, in the House. Um, at Reed, of course, is dealing with a different group of people, a different constituency, and one that can easily pull that lever. And, and therefore, that tension uh, was always there. I think at one point, somebody says to her, uh, as I remember in the book, somebody says, you know, well, the Senate is dysfunctional. And she said, no, the Senate used to be dysfunctional. That was when they were good. Yeah. And, 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 that's, and that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the perpetual challenge that House people face. You've prompted me to, uh, to tell the, what I think is the best anecdote about the Senate, which is when George Mitchell was leaving, he uh, interviewed to be baseball commissioner. And he came out of the interview, and a friend of his who was there said, George, I don't know why you'd want to take this job. You'd be dealing with 28 of the most out-of-control egos in the world. And Mitchell said, that would be a 72% reduction <laughs> for my current job. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of other people. So uh, Rahm Emanuel s uh, served in the House, and many argued that uh, he was on a path to become Speaker if and when Pelosi left. And then he took the job as Obama's Chief of Staff. And he was, I think one could safely argue, a protege of Nancy Pelosi when he was in the House, at least in some respects. And then Phil Shalero, who uh, was a longtime House staffer with Henry Waxman, takes over the position as uh, legislative liaison in the Obama administration. Work, walk us through a little bit of uh, what happens when people leave the House and go to the White House, and then Rahm comes back and constantly tries to undermine a, a uh, comprehensive health care plan to do it in bits and pieces, which Nancy Pelosi strongly resisted, and to her credit, it worked. And Phil Shalero is bringing back all of these messages about what the White House will or won't do, and oftentimes they drop the ball when it comes to the needs that are there. Yeah. And the tensions that then exist with people who used to be allies, yeah. and but now even in their same party, are on a different team. Yeah, and of course, you know, when, you, when Rahm called me up and said, uh, the president elect is asking me if I want to be chief of staff. I said to him, and I relate this in the book, I said, you better think about that because, you know, you're not Congressman Emanuel, you're staff. And, and uh, you know, your head will roll and you're going to have a different relationship with us. I think Rahm thought, and I, I suspect Obama thought, um, that Rahm and Phil, because they had such deep roots in the House, were, were going to sort of balance off a Senate-heavy staff of course, Obama comes out of the Senate. Some of the key people around Obama had not even worked for him in the Senate. They were sh the Chicago uh, crowd. Um, and uh, Rahm constantly liked to play that card. As, uh, and there's one incident, I can't remember exactly which bill it is, but he's, he's in, we're, just the three of us were in a meeting, and he is telling the speaker, you know, look, I, I, I know exactly what tensions you're dealing with. We're in the, in the conference room. Uh, in the speaker's uh, chambers, and he said, you know, I've spent my life around this table. And she said, no, you didn't, Rom. You spent six years around this table, okay? You know, so she, she was not conceding that, that role to him. And um, it's true. I mean, I think particularly around health care, uh, Rom's not here, is he? <laughs> He's in Japan. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I think that, well, don't, don't repeat this, okay? Uh, uh, you know, I think that R Rom had a, a reputation in general as, as caring maybe a little less about some of the details of legislation than checking the box and moving along. And he particularly had a lot of resentment among the minority caucuses in the House in that regard that um, he was more interested in, in, in registering a victory. And that became a, a huge issue around health care. Um, it's exhaustively dealt with within the book. Uh, he became convinced, and in fact, as did many others uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the White House, that because of both procedural and internal problems and interbranch problems, we just weren't going to get a comprehensive bill. I mean, we knew there were provisions that were in trouble, like the, the public option, where we had Joe Lieberman just said, you're not going to get the public option. You can do whatever you want. You're not getting the public option. Um, and at various points, Rom would suggest 
quietly what, what I refer to in the book as the Titanic plan, which is women and children first. And, you know, we're just going to cut out some of those other issues that people wanted, like age 26 on your parents' plan. Um, and he was very sensitive about that. At, at one point, he called me up and he was suggesting, you know, maybe we could do it this way, this way. And he said, don't you dare tell anybody. If you do, we're never going to speak to each other again, which was an interesting prospect. And, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, the, uh, the next day we're in the Oval Office and we're talking with the President and the Vice President about this and, and Reed, and the Speaker is talking with the President and says, um, now I know there are people on your staff who are, are, are you know, urging you to take the, uh, the Namby Pamby plan or something. And, and Rom turns to me and just mouths, thanks. And I said, you know, wasn't it wasn't me I mean it wasn't like a state secret it, but but he so he he you know played that there was a tense role there where I think he and very likely the president thought he was serving as an unofficial liaison between the house and senate that's not the way Nancy Pelosi saw it you were either in the house doing the house's work and dealing with all the tensions of the house or you were doing the administration's work and trying to influence the house that way I think Phil um, felt a lot of those tensions. Phil, of course, played that role as a staff person. He was not a former member. He was a staff person, and he was a staff person who had left Waxman and gone over and worked briefly for Daschle, and then had gotten to know Obama and worked on, on the campaign. Um, Phil's role, I think, in a lot of what transpires in, in the course of this book is critical because he, Reed's chief of staff, Gary Myrick, and I uh, would meet every week and we would have what we called the Phil, John, and Gary meetings. And they were off the record, and we would just tell each other, then that happen. It's not going to happen this way, folks. I mean, we got to go around a different way. And, and, and we would find ways to get that information back to the bosses uh, without ever saying we had collaborated. And I, I, I use that in the book as a way of illustrating something that I think is well known to people who work on the Hill but not understood by people who don't work on it, and that is how much the staff is doing this back-channel action and, and how important that kind of, of staff collaboration is. I did the same thing, incidentally, with Boehner's person, with Paula Nowakowski, both in the Education Committee and, and, uh, uh, and when she was working with Boehner in, in the leadership, where the members were out screaming and yelling at each other, and we'd go in the back room and say, what do you really want to do? And we'd, you know, we'd sort of cut that deal, and then we'd go out, and, and, and you could get that, that done. So, it was Phil's was a very very valuable uh, a very valuable position to have. So uh, as we talk about Rom, uh, Rom of course notoriously potty mouth. Uh, you know Obama joked that he had lost his middle finger in an accident at an early age. It almost rendered him mute. <laughs> and and Nancy hates dirty words. When you if you saw the video of her saying they left poo poo in the house chamber, that's how she talks. She doesn't use those words. That must have created some interesting tensions between uh, the two of them. Uh, yes. There, there, she, she does not, uh, even in private, it, it is rare for her to, I mean, occasionally she will, she, I can't remember exactly which incident it was, but she was talking and she, she used, uh, she used a, a stronger than usual expletive and then and then parenthetically added and I don't talk that way although of course she just had talked that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that way but um, yeah she um, I, I remember uh, at one point Obama was talking to her uh, about a, a bill that she, that had been passed and of course Joe Biden had famously in the signing ceremony for the Affordable Care Act in front of a live mic had whispered to the president this is a big effing deal and uh, and the president I guess thought that was kind of cute so in this conversation with her I, it may have been on the phone so he said to her in relation to this other piece of legislation well you know as Joe would say it's a big effing deal and she said Yes, as he would say, you know, but uh, she, she, would not, uh, she would not repeat that. Uh, so uh, talk for a minute or two about her relationship with Barack Obama. Uh, you say multiple times, you quote Obama as praising her to the skies, uh, but there were obvious tensions there as well. Yes, and I think some of those tensions, look, she, 
there's a there's a whole chapter in the book about the campaign of 2008 in which Pelosi assiduously maintained her neutrality and she did that um, because she was the chair of the convention and she would have to make decisions uh, about seating delegations and rules decisions that if she were perceived to be on one side or the other um, would uh, potentially create even deeper problems in how, how the problems would be resolved. I think there was a growing sense, and uh, there are some incidents and some meetings in the book that are discussed, that she over, overall she favored Obama. Um, and in part, that was because she understood the beneficial effect he would have on many congressional races. And we did feel that in order to have the kind of legislative success we were going to have, we had to have not just a majority, we had to have a huge majority. And that Obama, in terms of his, uh, his, his uh, ability to intensify the Democratic electorate, was, was, was preferable. There were also some other things that went on with respect to the Clinton staff and even the former president, where perhaps they were not using the right strategy with Mrs. Pelosi, to put it politely. Um, but when Obama then moves to the presidency, it's a very different. If it's a very different matter, we were, for example, in a fight with the, with the Bush administration over subpoenas of all things, uh, about whether or not Josh Bolton uh, and um, uh, and Harry Myers were going to have to respond to a subpoena uh, uh, over the firing of uh, assistant U.S. attorneys. And uh, Obama, while he was in the Senate, was a hundred percent with us because as an institutionalist, of course, the Congress has to be able to, uh, to subpoena people in the executive branch. What's interesting, and, and of course Bush wouldn't do that, and it dragged over into the new administration. And what was interesting was that within a couple of weeks, Obama uh, calls up the speaker and says, you know, Nancy, now that I'm in this position defending the prerogatives of the executive branch, I think, you know, you're really just going to have to take a written deposition or something. It's just not going to work out. And her response, of course, is uh, that's not sufficient. Uh, and in this instance, it's not Nancy. It's Madam Speaker. Uh, and, and, and I, you know, I think that was a telling uh, conversation because if there's anything Nancy Pelosi believes in, fervently it is that she is the defender of the house of representatives and her members in the house of representatives and there is you know the house is a co-equal branch of government this notion that the white house dictates policy or that she is simply supposed to she and her house members are supposed to submit to the majority the super majoritarian will of the senate that just doesn't fly however as I mentioned before, she is somebody who thinks aspirationally, who, who constantly would castigate. She would tell Obama, for example, right during the campaign, and particularly in the, in the period after the election, uh, th think entrepreneurially. You know, she would talk about the Gallatin plan that I think was Jefferson's plan for massive internal public works. Don't be talking little stuff. Don't, don't bring all the old Clinton economic people. Think entrepreneurially. Think, think expansively, innovatively. And she really believed that. And, and of course, given the nature of the House, she could pass legislation in the House that reflected that perspective. The interesting thing to me is that she also knew that the likelihood of actually accomplishing that, given the realities of dealing with the Senate, were limited. And her great skill, I believe, is not that she was able to pass all that great liberal legislation through the House. Not that it was easy. I mean, the, the House's factions are, you know, are, are nightmarishly difficult to negotiate. But she did that because she had to show that her liberals, she was fighting as hard as she was for them, for Colin Peterson on the conservative side, and for, for Ellen Tauscher, and, and others who were, who were, who were always in, in, in the middle. Her real magic was that she could take the compromise back to those people and say, I fought as hard as I could, this is as good as it's going to get, and have the credibility that they would accept it. Because the, if they didn't, you would easily lose both the people who had opposed the bill in the first place as well as potentially some liberals. And that, that um, confidence that her members had, that she had fought as diligently on their behalf and on behalf of the institution as she could, I think is what allowed us to have the legislative successes that we had. And, uh, you know, as you 
go through some of these battles and, and realize what it took to keep all of these members in line, uh, you realize what skill that is. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not shy about no. making their demands. Before we turn to Q&A, there are two other areas uh, I'd like you to explore. Uh, one is just to reflect for a minute or two on uh, the book takes us through 2010, um, but what you've seen in changes in the party since, and uh, since uh, much of what you had to deal with from the stimulus package on also includes uh, Kevin McCarthy and the role that he played. Just reflect for a little bit on where you think we might be going uh, as we look ahead mm. with two parties. Yeah. Then the second area, just for a few minutes, is to talk about Nancy Pelosi the person, uh, which I think is uh, something that you have unique insights yeah. into. So uh, in December of 2008, we had lost the House. Uh, a lot of House Democrats had voted with Mrs. Pelosi and had lost their seats and had, were not particularly upset about having done so. They felt that they had they had done what they came to do and and uh i ran into john boehner who i had known for years because of the work in the education committee and had a good relationship with him um i ran into him in the hall and i said uh you know congratulations I, you're going to be speaker i have some idea what that involves I, you know good luck uh not too good luck but good luck you know you know i hope and he said to me john in six months, I'm going to be more popular in your caucus than I am in my own caucus. And I ran into him six months later in his office. Julia, the new prime minister of, of Australia, was there, and he that was invited uh, to that reception. I said, so how's that working for you? And he said, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. And the reason being, he knew that the reason he had been, that the Republicans had been elevated was not because of a, of a, you know, a specific legislative program. It was because of this reaction. You know, remember their slogan in 2010 was fire Pelosi. That's as sophisticated as it got. They went all around the country with a bus, you know, fire Pelosi. Um, he knew that he had been elevated by the election of people who were really anti-institutional and who viewed him as an institutional or an establishment Republican almost as negatively as they, viewed, as they viewed Nancy Pelosi. They had no interest in legislating. And as I mentioned, they, uh, for the success of three years until they ultimately convinced him to shut down the government, um, never passed a major piece of legislation without 40 to 50 Democratic votes. They could never get more than 179 votes, even for things like continuing resolutions and debt ceiling increases. Um, fast forward to now, uh, you know, the people who could come in in two weeks, they make, they make the Tea Party look like James Madison. You know, they, 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 because they, they detest the notion of government. There isn't even a pretext of having a legislative, um, a legislative uh, uh, agenda. And I, I mean, I'm concerned on a whole series of levels, but one of them is that I don't know that the Democratic Party, which feels that it, it, it delivered votes at crucial moments and got no credit for that, um, now feels that it's gone forward and put out legislation such as prescription drug caps uh, for, for seniors or an infrastructure bill or a competes act uh, to promote uh, technology and, and, and the, the technology bill uh, to, to build domestic capability. They don't feel they've gotten credit for that. Um, maybe they haven't done a very good job of selling it or, or registering the impact of it in, in time for the election. But when the, when, if a Kevin McCarthy who has zero personal relationship with Nancy Pelosi. I mean, John Boehner was her best friend in the world compared to the relationship to, to, to Kevin McCarthy, who, incidentally, if you've missed that, said at one point not long ago, he, he would take the gavel when he got it from her and hit her in the head with it. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I don't know that Democrats are going to be there that th this next time. They may say, you know, this is, you're, you're the majority, you figure out how to run it. And I don't think that Kevin McCarthy, frankly, has a clue and, and one of the reasons is, unlike a Nancy Pelosi, he does not have the capability of per being persuasive. 
He's not the leader of that party. He happens to be the elected leader, but he doesn't have the soul of that party and he doesn't have the respect of that, of that leadership. He doesn't have a soul, uh, frankly. Um, uh, I, I wanted to, you asked the personal side, yeah. um, which I think today is uh, particularly poignant. And I, and I have one story that I think um, sums that up. Um, my kid Emmy is sitting back there and Emmy has been a <laughs> has been a great friend of the speaker since birth, practically, I think. And um, uh, years ago, the speaker agreed to uh, come and do an honorary event at uh, uh, Imagination Stage in Bethesda. Uh, and Emmy sang, uh, the, it was a great singer, uh, sang uh, Nothing's Gonna Harm You from Sweeney Todd uh, to her on the stage. Uh, maybe 15 years ago or something, 10 years ago more than 10. Fast forward to election night 2018. And uh, sh uh, we go down to the election headquarters. Emmy goes in t to congratulate and, and the speaker says, what are you doing now? And Emmy says, oh, I'm in Sweeney Todd. The speaker says, I'm coming to see it. I said, uh, it closes on Saturday. This was Tuesday. And she says, I'm coming. And not only did she come, this is four days after being reelected. She had some calls to make, remember, because there were people saying they wouldn't vote for her. But I leaned over to her and I said, you know, nothing's gonna harm you is from this. And she said, oh, I know, you know, I have to leave after the first act. I have to be at Arlington tomorrow at 7.30. I said, yeah, but nothing's gonna harm you is in the second act. She said, then I'll stay. And she did. So when people say this is a cold, you know, this is a calculating, she's a machine. Uh, I think people who have had that kind of a personal interaction, um, and I know people where a spouse is taken ill and there are phone calls and there are flowers, just don't get that side of Nancy Pelosi, the importance of family, the importance of, of um, trust, and, and particularly the, the importance of loyalty. Well, I have to tell my own story if I can keep my composure, which I probably can't. When my son died on January 3rd, 2015, we had the Shiva Two days later, Congress had just convened on January 3rd. Nancy came to the Shiba and stayed for three hours, talking to everybody, three hours. She, didn't, she could have come and left. She could have sent flowers. She brought flowers. This is an extraordinary person. Yep. Q&A. Come to the microphone. And identify yourself, please. Identify yourself. My name is Paul Vanvis. Um, I'm going to try to ask this as broadly as possible. What is your concern about both the Congress and the government and American democracy if the Republicans, in fact, take back the Congress in two weeks? Well, it's profound. I mean, I think that, uh, again, this is a, the, the, the Nancy Pelosi always used to say that the Republicans needed to take back their own party. You know, this notion that you can, that you, uh, partisanship is, is endemic in a democratic society. It's not that you have disagreements. Even in, a, even in a situation where the parties are ideologically stratified, you still find ways to collaborate. Um, and, and she very strongly believed that, incidentally. Notwithstanding her reputation as a, as a hyper-partisan, she always said it's better to have, a, she told Obama in this private meeting that I was in in December of 2008, it's better to bring the Republicans into the process because you end up with legislation that endures when they inevitably end up in, in power. Now, the Republicans didn't want to do that. They famously, Chuck Grassley was asked, you know, by Obama, if, if I accept this amendment in the health care law, will you vote for it? And he said, no. Now, how about if I accept these two amendments? No. Is there anything I can do? No. If I give you all your amendments? No. You can't govern with that mentality. Um, there's a much deeper issue, of course, of partisanship and I think increasingly of disdain for the very concept of government and democracy that is not going to be solved in Congress. It's going to have to be solved deeper in the American public. I can't say I have an enormous confidence about that, but I, I am confident this is not something where members of Congress will set a new bar and it will... This, this is not going to be trickle-down democracy, okay? It's going to have to have some bubbling up. And unfortunately, between money, media, grassroots organizations, single issue, uh, social media and whatever, I think it gets harder and harder to do that because all of those variables 
reinforce the extremes. And unfortunately, one of those extremes has no interest in governing whatsoever or in defending the institutions of democracy. It is on. It is on, perfect. Um, well, thank you so much for this. Um, I think we've all seen, as you said, the dysfunction of the Senate being kind of like the golden era to look back on, where we now are far beyond that. Um, and with likely on next Tuesday, even more colorful characters um, joining the, the Senate. Do you think there is, a, it's time to have a conversation around abolishing the Senate as an institution? <laughs> Not within the Senate. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, as a practical matter, I don't, I don't see where that, that, that goes, and I'm not, I'm, I spent enough time working in Congress to know that I'm, I'm gonna focus on what I think is achievable rather than, than, than what's aspirational, at least that aspirational. Um, but I do think that given the constitutional problems the Senate possesses, where you know, initially the disparity between the largest and smallest states were 12 to one, now it's 70 to one, um, that what they don't need is an additional uh, uh, supermajority to, as an, ex as an additional barrier. I think I alluded earlier, one of the great advantages of the House of Representatives is because it does, it is composed of small districts, and those districts can have special interests uh, represented, is you get a large cohort of minorities. And this is the sixth or seventh Congress in a row where minorities are larger than the majority minorities in the in the previous Congress and those are virtually wiped out when you get to the Senate so if the Senate prevails through the filibuster or even through the reconciliation process uh, you really lose the influence that uh, that they are able to exercise in the house um, so I I uh, I, I've come to the, to the conclusion that there, yes, there may be bad things that happen if you get rid of the filibuster, but it's, at least it makes government responsive. At this point, things don't even happen because people put silent holds on bills and nobody knows why they died and there's no accountability. So I think you could eliminate that and at least uh, put the Senate and the House somewhat on a, on a more equitable uh, basis. But given my preferences, be entrepreneurial. Yeah, given my think, preferences, think larger, but given my preferences, it. you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the mat for <laughs> retaining the Senate. No. So, what do you think about uh, the idea that some of us are pushing for to enlarge the House? Um, we're actually looking at enlarging the House by 150, uh, given that the size was capped effectively in 1910 at 435. Uh, you and I have discussed this before, and it's it's not. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure adding another hundred some odd members of the House is 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 going to solve the problem. I I think that's driven a lot by the size of the districts, and those are clearly problematical. I think technology and the two year term compels House members to be receptive in a way that I don't think that people in the Senate necessarily are with with six year terms. So I'm just. I'm not. Uh, I, I I'm. I, I think that you, you need a house that um, is, is manageable, and I think this size is manageable. You need one that is reflecting the public will as, uh, as uh, the, the founders you know, initially said. Nancy Pelosi likes to say you know, that the advantage of house members is they go home every, every weekend, they put their hand on a hot stove, and they come back to Washington and they reflect it, sometimes for better, sometimes uh, for worse. And, you don't you don't get that with with the other institutions. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, I actually live in Fort Lauderdale and work in Miami. So my question is related to actually within the Democratic Party. I'm watching my state turn from purple to fully red. We, we're very worried about that right now. Um, and one of the things that uh, with my large uh, social network of Cuban Venezuelan folks is that the S words keeps coming up and I think that that is a I'm very worried about that word being um, kind of infusing the Democratic Party not just for Florida but also some of the Great Lakes states where you have a lot of descendants of Eastern Europeans yeah. and um, I wanted to find out what if anything the party is doing and can do to kind of uh, gain back a lot of the people who've left the Democratic Party and I believe a lot of them have left the Democratic Party because they, they do see, especially with people like, I hate to say this, Bernie Sanders and some of the other party um, folks, the squad, kind of 
giving the Democratic Party the same identity as the people, they, the governments they left behind yeah. in their country. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think that's an important question, but it, 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 it points out to some extent challenges Democrats have with, with making their, their appeal and making their, 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 and, and making their message hit uh, effective. You know, you can count on one hand the number of people in the Democratic Party who are talking about defunding the police or talking about socialism, and yet there are elements of the media and obviously the, so, the social media that are capable of re repeating that sufficiently to the point where it comes to represent uh, the party. The Democratic Party's got a lot of issues th that divide it, but socialism is not one of is not one of them. And uh, you know, I don't think it's lost on any observer that. Um, the, the folks you're mentioning, and of course Sanders isn't even a member of the Democratic Party, uh, except when he wants to be president, is, is, uh, is that uh, you know, they all represent 70 to 75 percent Democratic districts. They all got to, to the House of Representatives by beating other Democrats, not by beating Republicans. And it's hardly surprising that the overwhelming majority of the rest of the party is not in bed with those, those more extreme uh, positions. But it's very hard to counter portion of the media and particularly social media's willingness to, to, to label Democrats that way. Hi, Hi ben. ben Palumbo. John, thank you for your yeah. excellent presentation. Thank you. A couple of questions. One, we hear constantly this question, how can these supporters of Trump believe what he says? So the first question is, what do you think the impact of the end of the fairness doctrine has been? And the second question is, what do you think the impact on the Supreme Court of the impact of the Supreme Court decisions allowing this flood of, of money in politics has been uh, to where we are today? Yeah. So, so the Fairness Doctrine has ended in 1987 um, uh, during the general deregulation frenzy of the Carter and, and, uh, and Reagan administrations. And, you know, uh, I, I think it's profound. Uh, I don't think it, it's, it, it explains things alone, but as you know, the Fairness Doctrine required that there be some balance in when, when you apply for a public license for, for broadcast. Um, Pat Moynihan used to say you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Uh, and I think we all realize that that is a quaint and antiquated uh, concept. And in part, it's because you've removed that. Yes, it would exist anyway with social media, and, but the combination of the elimination of the Fairness Doctrine with the emergence of technology that allowed cable TV and, and then the regulatory changes that allowed talk radio, I think, is, has exacerbated all these problems enormously. And just briefly on the subject of money, money is probably the piece of it that worries me the most um, because the court has placed it outside the realm of what Congress can realistically do anything about. Uh, you know, even the discussions that are had, for example, about uh, public financing of campaigns, pu what the candidates raise is not the issue. It, it's the special interest groups that are raising them tens of millions of dollars. I mean, people say so-and-so corporation is donating, you know, $20 million to this candidate. No, they're not. They're donating it to an independent expenditure that is acting on behalf of that candidate in all but name, and and the inability to get your hands around that, I think, is 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 really problematical. You know, we're talking about races of of astronomical proportions, and importantly, uh, something else to keep in mind is it's the fear of that money coming in that freezes the process. So it's not just that you can add up in the election and say X amount of millions of dollars were spent, and look what happened. What you also have to think is look at all the money that's lurking out there and leading members to go to subcommittee chairman, go to full committee chairman, go to leadership. They don't make me vote on that thing because if you do, $2 million is going to drop into my district. And it, the issue never is even debated. The issue never comes up. The $2 million isn't spent, but it's had its pernicious effect. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are out of time for any more questions. There will be a signing line, though. Uh, thank you all for coming. I said to fold up the chairs. I misspoke. Please don't leave them where they are. Thank you all so much for such a wonderful thank talk. You. Thank you.